unconventional coaching moves, a new college game day analyst, and Nebraska head coach Matt Rule will join us. This is the College Game Day podcast for Wednesday, February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day to those of you who observe and those of you who don't. Reese Davis and Pete Thamel, we both observe. Hopefully, Pete, you've uh, done something wise for Kate for Valentine's Day. I'm sure I'm sure that you have in the midst of you covering covering these unconventional coaching moves, people moving sideways, people moving down, backwards, and back to previous locales. It's kept you busy in an in an way that really hasn't been part of the norm in the past no it's been uh it's been a particularly busy february and the uh accommodating portals with those moves always make things interesting too although they've been a little quieter because we're so far in the semester of the quarter ucla wise and and bc wise but i guess we'll we'll start with the first domino here reese which was bill o'brien to boston college um you know a, a a sort of confluence of a lot of things to get Bill O'Brien back home. He obviously leaves Ohio State after just a couple of weeks, but that's really the job he's always wanted. His family was going to stay here in Boston while he was in Columbus. So uh, a match that makes a lot of sense, and I really think has some some pretty high-end potential. That, of course, led to Chip Kelly following uh, taking Bill's spot. Um I think Ohio State hired Chip Kelly faster than, uh, you know, before BC could even announce Bill O'Brien. It was, uh, there was not a lot of mystery there. Uh, Ryan Day obviously played for Chip Kelly at UNH. He was a quarterback when Chip was the offensive coordinator under Sean McDonald. And uh, there's a long, deep friendship history there. Uh, Ryan was his quarterback coach uh, for Chip at, I think, the Eagles and the 49ers. So there's a, there's a pretty significant, uh, depth to that relationship and uh you know if chip kelly just wants to go call plays he's taking a four million dollar pay cut and he's got some pretty good players to call plays with so um that led to deshaun foster being hired at ucla uh which is an interesting hire it's sort of like a a dabo sweeney hire they want a leader of men who can be a ceo of the organization and really energize los angeles in terms of nil and energize los angeles in terms of recruiting And uh, it'll be interesting pushing forward. Uh, Deshaun Foster's had running backs drafted in four consecutive drafts. So I think we can see where uh, where UCLA's identity will go. And then uh, the last one I'm babbling here, Reese, was uh, Ryan Grubb uh, leaving Alabama and staying home. He hadn't sold his home yet in Seattle and he's going to be the Seahawks O.C., um, he also brings Scott Huff, the excellent offensive line coach with him. His line won the Joe Moore Award last year. So uh, Kalen DeBoer is uh, promoting Nick Sheridan to OC and then running from behind a little bit just in terms of filling his staff for his first season at Alabama. And they've been able to pay well. They've hired two sitting head coaches. So just because your guy's a head coach, if he's got an offensive line background, maybe look out. You never know. That's one of the things that we can talk to a Nebraska head coach, Matt Rule, about. He's going to join us. Matt, a, a coach with a sterling reputation and a remarkable talent for the rebuild. It started first when he took the head coaching job at Temple after spending uh, many years as an assistant coach, including uh, a year with the New York Giants in the NFL. Temple is a place that has had precious little success, and he uh, won a conference championship, a couple of division titles there. He took Baylor when they were in the throes of a mess and built them into a contender and a champion and is attempting to do the same thing with Nebraska. And we're delighted to uh, be joined by one of the really good guys in coaching, Nebraska's head coach, Matt Rule. And we're pleased to be joined by the head coach of the Cornhuskers, Matt Rule. Matt, what would you say is the biggest improvement uh, from going into year two as opposed to when you've got the job or trying to get the program started? Well, I, I would say just the fact that, like, when I pull in the building in the morning, everyone knows, you know, kind of what to expect. Um, that first year is so hard, you know, it, you know. Young people, they want to do a good job. You show up. They, they don't know who you are. They don't, you know, you go out to the workouts. They don't know where to line up, where to stretch. So I would say the familiarity um, with what we're doing, even though half of our team is probably new. They weren't here this time last year. Um, <laughs> just having some veteran guys that know know the deal, know what to do. Um, that's probably the biggest improvement. And then, uh, you know, the players have moved into a brand new – I mean, we have a $165 million building that uh, probably – 
I don't, I, if it's not the best, it's one of the best and probably is the best. And uh, the guys are in there now. So, so when they get done, you know, doing mat drills and pulling sleds and all that stuff, they can go recover in, uh, in, in the state of the art place, which, you know, to me, I, I've always felt like if you, if you train them hard, you have to, you have to rest them hard. So. Well, when I was there uh, in the in the spring mat around draft time, uh, I was given a hard hat to go around the, the new facility. Reese, I'm not sure if it was because Matt was playing pickleball at the time, and it was for an errant shot because they kind of set up a makeshift pickleball court in the uh, in the in the concourse of uh, of the stadium, which I thought was which I thought was creative. Um, we talked a lot then, Matt, uh, about you know not looking at your time in the NFL as like uh, as, as a is a detraction from what you could accomplish. Like the, the fact that you were fired in the NFL, you took so much and you went through great lanes to sit in your office to, to how much you've learned. I'm curious a year and a season in how you saw your seasons in the NFL transfer to how you ran your program, how you ran game day and how it's made you a better coach. Well, I think very simply just the, uh, you know, football to me usually comes down to player acquisition, <laughs> player development, uh, player retention, which, <laughs> used to in, in, in football just being scholarship. Now it means NIL and all those things. I think I got sort of a crash course in it uh, in my time in the NFL. Um, so, I, you know, as you're sitting there and, and, and young people have the ability to kind of really now, now with multiple transfers hit, hit free agency every year. Um, I, I just feel like I have a better perspective on it. You know, I'm not emotional about it. Like, you know, there'd be, you know, there, you know, there'd be a player who's, you know, going to free agency with us or unhappy with their contract. And, I could let them, you know, deal with the GM, whether it was Marty Herney or Scott Fitterer, and just say, hey, whenever you get back, I'm ready to coach you in football again. And, and, you know, probably didn't have that ability before I went through that. So I think that that's really helped me. And, um, you know, as I kind of said to you at the time, like, you know, my, my time in the NFL was so unique in that it was COVID. You know, you're a college coach. They don't really know who you are. That's COVID. Mm-hmm. You never really got a chance to build relationships. And really in my last year, I felt like, um, I tried to, you know, make up for lost time and tried to tried to really connect with some guys and, and, and I feel like I did and still have a lot of those connections. And so as I came back here, I wanted to do the same thing. And, you know, we get to the end of the season and three guys that have probably draftable grades decide to come back and play another year. No one really goes into the portal um, looking to cash in. Um, I think I think it started with, you know, just really spending time with everybody and instead of just doing stuff, explaining what I'm doing and just, you know, taking time to be pretty intentional. There are so many things that you said that I want to touch on that are important, but nothing more important than uh, what what did Pete look like in a hard hat? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, Pete's, he's got that whole little Boston swag. You know, he's got the like, you know, he's got that got that jacket on, so he can pull anything off. And uh, you know, yeah, he's not going to write anything bad about you, Matt. Don't lie, Pete. In a hard hat is hilarious. I mean, come on. <laughs> It's more, more housework than, I, than I've done in South Boston. I didn't, you know, in that day, kicking through the sawdust. So. Uh, you, you mentioned portal, player acquisition, and the differences in, in coaching both places. I, for years, Matt, I've always been of the opinion that a great college job was better than just about any NFL job. I, I don't know that I believe that anymore, simply because of the calendar that you guys are under. What what do you think right now? How how attractive is it uh, to be in charge of everything, continual free agency, uh, managing the money, and all of the things that really you don't get the mandated off time that that professional coaches get? What's what's the biggest uh, the biggest attraction of still being a big time college coach? Well, I think, you know, it's like anything else, you know, there, there's good and there's bad and two things can be true. And so I think the great thing about college is, you know, when you're the head football coach at a place like Nebraska, you, you know, you're going to you're going to decide who comes in. You're going to decide uh, the way that you do things. You know, you're not answering to, a, you know, a third party. You're not you know, you're, you're, you're being collaborative, but you're also at the end of the day, uh, you, you yield extreme ownership. And, and and if it you know if something goes wrong, it goes wrong on your watch and, and you can something's not going the right way you can redirect just because you're, it's kind of you, you're in charge. And so that, um, you know, that, that, that makes sense to me, you know, it makes, you know, it makes sense to, 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 Hey, you know, put leadership in one spot and kind of start it from there. Um, but the calendar is tough. You know, the calendar is really tough. And obviously we were not in a bowl game. And I think what's happening, uh, uh, Reese is like, you know, we keep trying to fix 
something. And sometimes, like, when you, you just got to blow it up, right? Like, you can only put your house on stilts so many times. Sometimes you got to knock it down and rebuild it. And I think we have to rebuild the calendar. Um, you know, they've done some good things. You know, they, they're the dead period in February, the dead prayer, you know, like, I could take my family to Chicago this weekend and go see a Blackhawks game and not worry, like, oh, the number one so-and-so is coming through this weekend, you know, because I want to be there when mm-hmm. recruits come through. I love recruiting. Sure. Yeah. Um, but they've, so they've done some positive things. But, man, I got done, and it was December was a grind recruiting. You're doing the portal. Then you come back early January is the portal. Then later January we finally can talk to, to families and recruits when we're on the road. But it's a lot. Um, I, I really believe you have to kind of – you have to really kind of be called to, like, want to work with young people to be a great college coach. And you have to believe that uh, you're helping them with their lives. And so – but it definitely takes a lot of time. You know, one of the reasons why I went to the NFL is – not only do I want to be a great coach, I want to be a great dad to, you know, Bryant, Vivian, Leona. And in the off season, you know, you can be done at five, you can be done at four, you can go see your kids' baseball games. And so I think the thing that I have to do here is I have to, you know, try to outwork everybody, but every once in a while I'll leave and go watch a volleyball game, go watch a softball game, <laughs> let my coaches do the same and make sure that uh, our kids in the program and our kids on, at home um, all feel the same thing. So, uh, it's really unique. I, I I could talk for hours about the calendar because it's it's pretty brutal right now, and 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 they could, and I'm sure they will. I think they're looking at it. Hopefully, they'll make some you know changes here soon. Matt, what did you think of uh, some of the sentiment that emerged in the last couple of weeks? We saw Jeff Halfley go to the NFL. We saw Chip Kelly in your league now leave a head coaching job for an offensive coordinator job. Saw a bunch of Group of Five guys. I, I want to say. Uh, at least two group of five guys and then the North Dakota State coach go and take assistant jobs in, in different places. Um, just I'm curious what, what you saw in those in those moves and does it say anything about our industry? I think it's, you know, a lot of people are saying, oh, look how hard it is. I think it speaks more to how much money we're paying assistant coaches. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know uh, like, you know, I can go make $5 million as a head coach or $4 million as a head coach, $3 million, whatever it is, or I can go make $2 million to call plays. Or whether, I think there's... You know, there's defensive line coaches making 1.8, 1.9 now. So yeah. um, I think it's more about the money that you can make without all the added stress. You know, I, I say this, being a head coach is rarely about actual X's and O's in football. Sure. You know, there's obviously the great play callers, the Lane Kiffins of the world. And I mean, but even even in those roles, they still have to do so many other things. And, you know, it used to be that, you know, I would I would this time of year coach the team. I would go speak and do some developmental, you know, development type things, raise some money for the program. Now you add in raising, you know, raising and building relationships for NIL, uh, you know, uh, advertising for your collectives. It's just added to, to this time frame. But um, I, I think some guys probably say to themselves, you know what, I'd love to just go coach football. I'd love to go call plays. And, and being a head coach really isn't about very often calling plays. Or if it is, it's, it's only on a couple Saturdays. It's really about running an organization and making sure that everything's optimized and we get held accountable for everything. We get held accountable for player academics. We get held accountable for player discipline. You know, I mean, everything comes back at us. So you're you're constantly having to be vigilant about all those things. What makes you a great rebuilder? Because as I look at this, you've, you've taken three distinctly different and four, if you want to, you know, in counting the NFL job temple where I mean, they had they had shown some improvement, but no one believed you could really win there. Baylor was in in a mess of its own making, and I believe you almost viewed that as a a mission a type. And then Nebraska was a little bit different. It, there was um, people were perplexed as to why they couldn't get it right. What makes you a good rebuilder? First of all, I appreciate you saying that. Second of all, I hope I live up to that here. Um, <laughs> you know, I will say this. I think I loved Temple because I had been there as an assistant coach for six years. So mm-hmm. I had this deep, you know, belief in Temple and what we could do there. Um, as you said, I'm the son of a minister and a football coach. So going to Baylor and to me, rebuilding Baylor was if we just got it back to its its stated purpose. Like there's nothing worse than a Christian university that you almost kind of like look at like sarcastically, you know, because of what's happening there. So you know, the football was the bonus there. But I was, as you said, kind of felt called and on sort of a mission to be there. You know, to me, I, I love college football. And I I'm the, historically love college football. So to come to Nebraska and, um, you know, help Nebraska retain its rightful place in football makes total sense. Um, in terms of, you know, why I think I'm able to do it, I think it's because um, – I really don't mind. Uh, uh, I don't like, but I don't. I, I, I'm willing to do what it takes to win in the long run, um, and that's probably hurt me a lot in the NFL because I probably wasn't enough. Hey, let's win right now. I was probably like, hey, let's build this for four or five years, and it didn't end up getting that time. But 
you know, I went, when I went to Temple, when I went to Baylor, it was about, hey, let's let's pay the price now for success down down the line. And, um, you know, even even Reese at, at, at Baylor, when sometimes when things would come up and, you know, we'd be in a meeting talking and, you know, people would talk about the optics. And I would always say, like, let's let let's let history write our story. Let, like, let's not worry what people are writing right now about what we're doing. Let's let's worry about 10 years from now what people write about what we're doing. So if we're going to do something that's controversial that people don't like, but we think it's the right thing. Let's do that. And I, I think if you take that over to football, um, I try to do the right thing. I try to do what's going to be in the best interest of the long term vision for what we're trying to build. And if that means we have to start out two and ten or, you know, unfortunately, this year we were five and three, we finished five and seven. It doesn't mean I enjoy those things. It just means I know right now we are so much further ahead than where we were last year. And, and, and any time a coach calls me that gets a new job, I always tell him, don't worry about winning the first year. Worry about building something you can be proud of, building a foundation. And then the winning will come. And so I think that that is probably what, what that confidence that, hey, it'll work out in the long run is probably what's allowed me to do it at the college level. And um, uh, the, the only other thing I'll say is I think because I truly believe that I and my staff really care about these young people. Like even if I have to dismiss them from the team, I always tell them like, there's nothing you can do that will make me not care about you. Now there's a standard here you have to live up to. And I, I think when you do that and you go through hard times and the players see you not changing and they see you not turn their a lot of times in their lives people have changed on them and turned their back on them i think we get real buy-in on a on a personal level that allows us to uh you know take some huge huge steps when when we talked about some of the you were you were very adamant this spring matt that the roster was not outclassed in in the big 10 there may have been a, a program or two but it wasn't like you were completely outclassed you know throughout throughout the schedule you obviously have had a significant amount of roster turnover so let, let nothing nothing springs hope eternal like looking at a upcoming schedule home games utep colorado northern iowa and illinois to start the four first four weeks in september or i guess august 31st technically what are two or three just aspects of your program be they position groups be it conditioning or just what are two or three things you think have jumped significantly to to prepare you to kind of hit this second phase of the rebuild well well definitely our, our definitely our strength i mean like I, I you know i was on the road for those three weeks we mentioned i came back on a friday morning and walked out and i was like damn we have a good looking team you know we don't have we're not a big fat team the only fat guys are the coaches on our on our, on our, <laughs> our like we're like a big yoked up strong competitive team um, we have a lot of seniors, a lot of guys who've been through it. The one thing when you come to the, to the University of Nebraska, like the players, like there's a lot, there's half of our team that like were born and raised on this. You know, I tell them, I say, like, all of our guys are, are Huskers, but some of our guys are corn Huskers, man. Like they grew up, like they grew up mm-hmm. on this. And so they have a deep passion. There's a mission from them to be part of the class that turned it around. And so I would say just our overall strength and just sort of our resolve of having an older group those two things really helped. You know, I did a really bad job early in the year last year, like our first two games at Minnesota, at Colorado. And when you kind of get into the NFL, the guys are so mature, you get a little bit lulled into like, you know, there's not many stadiums in the NFL that are like just so overwhelming. You know, there's a couple, don't get me wrong. But a lot of times, you know, it's not. And going to Minnesota, it's the first game of the year and they do a gold out. Like I've never heard of a team doing like a, a, a uniform thing in, in the crowd for, um, for a college game. But the crowd noise affected us. Then we went to Colorado. It was a, uh, it was uh, you know, it was low. I think we're much more prepared this year for the big moments, you know. But um, you know, I, I, I again, I'll say, uh, Pete, like we, we knew we were gonna have a pretty good defense last year. We were young on offense. I think we caught up offensively, talent wise, this year. So we'll still be young, you know. It comes down to players. I saw Michigan had 18 guys go to the, uh, get invited to the combine. Um, you know, and I, if you want to know how good of a team we have, you usually can just look at how many guys go to the combine. And so Michigan had a pretty good team, obviously. So we'll get there, and we're, we're headed that way, I think. Good place to start is quarterback, and it seems like, uh, seems like you have a, a star quarterback in the making anyway. How did it how, – tell me the story of how it came to be that you realized you were back in the mix for Dylan Rayola and then wound up with him coming to Nebraska. You know, um, I love to sit there, and, and people say to me, like, what was your pitch? I literally was driving home, had my kids in the car. Julie was in the car. Um, he called. I told everyone to be quiet. I talked to him over, and he was like, hey, coach, I think I want to come come to Nebraska. And I was almost like, come on. I was like, are you sure? Like, you know, and he said, I want to come visit. And I said, well, don't come visit unless you're serious about this. You know, why dredge up all that drama? And he came, and he wanted to come. What I do believe is 
throughout the process, you know, if you if you know uh, Dylan, he he's, he cares very much about who he is and relationships. It's not just about everything else. And, you know, we recruited him really hard. And, and then he decided he was going to go to the University of Georgia. And we wished him the best. You know, we didn't continue to recruit him. We, you know, he, he'd text us after games because his uncle's here and his dad played here. And he'd say, Coach, you know, hey, good luck. That, but just maintain a very professional, like, family type relationship and um uh he came to the michigan game we got kind of bludgeoned in the michigan game unfortunately and and afterwards you know the next day he came in to say goodbye and i talked to him talked to his family and you know wasn't pressing him wasn't recruiting him was just like hey, i care about you for you and good luck at georgia and i think all those things over time just kind of weighed on him i think you know he knew that you know this is a place that means a lot to him and i think he saw what i saw what if we can be a small part of returning nebraska to what it what it should be, not what it used to be, what it should be. And I think that's a big difference. And so I think he felt that historical opportunity that I felt and and um, made the call. Were Julie Bryant and the girls able to stay quiet with Dylan Rayola all of a sudden just get jumping on the hook right there, uh, right there on the Bluetooth? <laughs> you know, what's funny is, is, is Leona and Vivi don't they just know him as Dylan. They could they don't know anything about the they, uh, uh, Julie. Um, yeah, well, she's probably mad at me for something. You know, I'm I'm not the best in the car. I'm not a great driver. And Brian knows everything. Brian texts me like every five minutes with a recruiting tip that I'm like, I know. I, I paid for everything. So, yeah, he was probably pretty locked in. So what do you expect from him this season? You know, um, I'm really passionate about, like, Coach Paterno used to always say, like, uh, uh, better a play too late than a play, a play too soon. Like, put guys in when they're ready. And so, you know, we have Heinrich Harburg, who, you know, he went five and three as the Nebraska starter next year. And really the one of the third game he lost, he only played two series and then got hurt. So really I look at it like five and two. We have Danny Kalen, who's an elite 11 quarterback coming in. We have Dylan coming in. So um, I, I told Dylan the moment he got here, like, don't worry about being the five-star quarterback. Don't worry about being all these things. Expectation weighs us down. Just, just, just play ball. And, I'm way more interested in where in where Dylan, where Danny, where Heinrich, where all of our guys, where they end up, you know, not where they are in year one. That's one of the things I think that's stressing out our young people. They're so worried about like, am I going to play? I'm like, bro, worry about where you are as a senior. You know, like worry about worry about where you are when the time is over. So, based upon what I've seen, he's in here all the time. I mean, he is he is committed to to doing this and doing this at a high level. Um, so I want to see him compete. I want to see him have fun. I want to see him play fearless. You know, you're going to make mistakes. We had so many turnovers last year at Reese. We were minus mm-hmm. 17 on the year. You should, you know, really you should be two and nine or two and 10. That's kind of the narrative. And you know what? That's last year. We'll have to improve that as coaches, but I want to see Dylan come here and rip the ball and go try to make plays and have fun and see Danny do that and see Heinrich do that. And I would say there's probably a pretty good chance we'll end up having to play all three. That's kind of modern college football. Uh, what does it take? I mean, you the confidence there, because if you look back this past season, you guys had a number of one possession losses and certainly the previous tenure, it was well documented. The difficulty Nebraska had getting over the hump in games. How do you approach that from a mental standpoint with your team that when the time comes, do they expect to win? Do they believe they can make the play to win? You know, um, it's, it's, it's really funny. It's the number one job I have to do, right? And um, I said this, I had a, pre, a radio thing yesterday. I said this, so forgive me for repeating it, but I really believe this. Like when we had those close losses, you know, and it's, it's five, game, uh, you know, five games by either a field goal or an overtime. When we had those close losses, maybe on the last drive, for me it was like painful. I, I love those kids that were seniors. I wanted them to win, but I was like, man, we're so close. We'll go. We'll get a little bit better. We'll trade harder. We'll chase those three points, and then – We'll come back next year and, and we'll win a lot of we'll, a lot of close losses will become close wins and then eventually close wins become big wins. So for me, it's like this unbelievably positive. Look how close we are in year one. For a lot of people here, it's man, it's like five or six years of that. Well, I wasn't here for those five or six years, so I don't feel that. I don't think that. I won't speak that into existence. But that's kind of become the the narrative. And my thing is, just like when you win a championship, you don't carry that over to the next year. Neither does losing. Mm-hmm. I do understand, though, that a lot of our guys, when they get into the moment, man, they're thinking about what if, like what if this happens, instead of actually focusing on what is actually happening. And that, that's the fun part as a coach. You know, when you have good players that you believe in, helping give them the gift of belief. 
give them the gift of confidence. You know, we can't make people confident by saying, you're a great player, it'll always work out. Sometimes it doesn't work out. But I can hopefully train them and coach them and put them in enough situations to inoculate them to when they get to the moment. All I want to see us do is when the game is on the line, I want to see our guys rip it and go play. And so it's one thing for me to do it. I do believe like one or two great players can bring that to a team, right? Like you're out there and you're in the Super Bowl and you're playing with Patrick Mahomes. Like you're like, man, I'm going to let it rip because if, if I if I make a mistake, Patrick's probably going to make me right. And that kind of starts to grow and then it takes off. So that's my number one job is to help our team get into those moments and anticipate winning, not anticipating, oh, here we go again. One thing, Matt, that your team did uh, on a high level last year is, uh, is is stop the run and play defense. Uh, this was your first time with Tony White as your coordinator, playing in a, a, a coaching a three three five, correct? Yep. Um, so what I'm curious about is uh, what did Tony do when he bring? And I know he was obviously just a candidate at UCLA. Give us a little window into why that side of the ball had such instant success under Tony. Well, well, Tony's dynamic. He's really smart. Um, he cares about the players. He gets the players to play for him. Uh, he's not one of those guys who's like, hey, here's my system. Like, you know, we would draw up a defense. Like, hey, here's a blitz we put in. We ran with Coach Snow over the last 10 years. You know, I was with Phil Snow for 10 years. I love the man. Like, hey, this is – and, and Tony's like, oh, let's look at – like, it's, it's, there's just no ego there, man. He's just – he's on the headset. You know, I'm a little bit – you know, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm anxious. I get – you know, I got a hot Italian temper. And he's over there. He's like, you know, all right, here we go. Here we go. Okay. Um See, they're in 20, and he's just the coolest dude in the room. And so I think he was a great fit for me, like my high running style and him just being till he, till he gets set off. I think he melded. Well, think about how confident he is. He came in to be the D coordinator, and all three position coaches were already hired. All three had previously coached for me, and all three had played for me. And he was like, I'm good. I'm great. I mean, that's just how good he is. That's why he's going to be an amazing head coach uh, because he can just kind of deal with whatever comes his way. And, um, I think one of the things that I don't hear said enough is like if you want to be a good defense in college football, you have to practice defense. Everyone's always like, you know, I watch these poor guys. They go they go play for a guy who throws the ball 50 times a game. They're the D coordinator. And everyone's like, why can't they stop? Well, because they don't touch anybody at practice. They don't <laughs> hit anybody. And I'm not saying that's wrong. Like, like if I'm one of those offensive coaches, great. But, like, don't blame the – if you want to be great at defense, you have to tackle in practice. You have to thud in practice. You have to go ones-on-ones all the time. Like – you got to train people to do unnatural acts and become great at them. And then you have to drain the backups, right? You can't be like where you don't give them reps. So we, I mean, we get 50, 60, 70 reps for the ones and then the twos and then the threes. And um, it's a, it's a culture of physicality here that might detract sometimes from our passing game, but we're going to play great defense and we believe in it. And so Tony came in, he hadn't really been around that. He adapted right to it. Um, and we have really good players on defense. A lot of old, older guys that have played a lot. But we went from last in the Big Ten in total run defense to, I think, first, second or in the top three. So I'm uh, really proud of the guys, really proud of Tony and his staff. You know, I, I think we have a lot of sensibilities that are similar, Matt. But the one thing we also have in common is that we have uh, both worked with Trev Alberts. In, in some respect, if a head football coach actually works for anyone these days, I guess in some ways uh, you work for him. And then Trev worked for me for a few years on the set when he was there. Has he told you any stories that begin with the phrase, you know, Matt, I was raised on a farm. <laughs> Does he ever bring, bring that up? <laughs> he, he's brought up, he's brought, he's like, oh, I'm just a, you know, I'm just, I'm just a, you know, farm guy from Eastern Iowa. I might not know anything, Matt. I'm like, all right, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I will say this, how, how lucky I am though, honestly, we used to have, to have an athletic director who's, played football at the highest level, who's really a business person, like his acumen and vision for, because that's what college football is becoming as you move forward. Like it's the haves and the have nots. And it's, it's, it's really like who has financially. And he's so good at that. But he also, because of his time, uh, you know, in, in sports media, like has such a great way of being able to articulate and speak. And I mean, it, it, he's able to, he's able to take that vision and communicate it out to people. But yeah, he does. He does try to do that whole that whole like you know, of, no, just you know, don't pay attention to me thing, and I'm not buying it. Oftentimes, it resulted in some type of controversy. There was a, there was an extensive story one night that started with you know, Reese, I was raised on a farm, and ended with a lesson about the inability to take the runt of a litter and make it special, and then he he directed 
uh, who the runt was at a particular program that has not had any success winning its particular division. <laughs> and that was controversial. If there had been such a thing as Twitter then, it certainly <laughs> would have broken Twitter when he did it that night. Ask him, ask him about the runt of the litter. And Ole Miss fans, I'm not saying who, but Ole Miss fans that might be listening to the podcast, <laughs> they haven't forgotten, that's for sure. I will walk so. upstairs afterwards and let them know. I have, yeah. them, have some smart work. I want to ask one more football question, then we're going to ask you a little, like, local call or local uh, neighborhood, maybe some maybe some culinary delights uh, quick, and we'll get you out of here, Matt. Um, Jamal Banks was a, an excellent receiver at Wake Forest. Isaiah Nair was an excellent receiver at Wyoming before he went to Texas. Uh, what have you seen from those guys? Because obviously your offense lacked a little bit of dynamism last year, and those guys have a history of being good. Now, again, you've probably seen them in shorts, you know, running around at 6 in the morning. So I'm just curious, like, the early feel for, for that, for those guys, and how they maybe can help change your offense, man. Yeah, they're, they're, they're really explosive. They're, they're, they're physical freaks. They're six foot three. They can run. They can jump. Um, yeah, to your point, I haven't seen them play football yet, but I have seen them move. So I, I can tell they have all of that. What's really cool, uh, I'll take Jamal. You know, he comes in. He's done all this stuff at Wake Forest. He comes into our kind of our way of doing things, you know, maybe a little more old school. We do all these off-season competitions, you know, like, hey, go to, a, go to a basketball game, get two points. Hey, go to a community service, get three points. Hey, um, he's by far and away the leading, the leading point getter. And so uh, what, what it's helping me do is what was, what was good enough last year is no longer good enough. And what was great last year is no longer great. It's just good enough. And so he's completely raised the bar. And that's what, that's what good players do. Uh, they, they go to a program and they, they, take, they, they show everybody that, like, to be great on the field, you also have to be great off the field. And that's what Jamal's doing. He's an excellent student, excellent person. He works his tail off. And um, I think we're doing a really good job of helping him uh, continue to develop his body to help him be a great pro. And then, you know, uh, Nayor is just, you know, he's, he's healthy now. He's so athletic, um, really anxious to see him. So I think the early, the early returns are pretty good. And um, we've got a really dynamic young receiving core. They're just young. Mm -hmm. um, and I think having a couple older guys, being able to watch a guy like Jamal will accelerate all of their development. It, are there bonus points in this competition structure for rushing the court after, like, say, knocking off Wisconsin or something? Did you get any bonus points for that? <laughs> we, I saw one of our players who has a torn ACL rush the court when the women beat Iowa. Like, what are you doing, bro? <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's really, really funny. Like, I took my, I took my daughters when we, we beat number one Purdue, mm -hmm. and my daughters were there with me, and, and we rushed them. My one daughter rushed the court. Leono didn't want to. And afterwards, she was so upset because she thought that meant, like, me, her, and Vivi were going to run out with no one else. She thought I was going to run out in the middle of the game. I'm like, no, it's everybody. So then when we, when we beat Iowa on Sunday, she's like, let's, let's, let's storm the court. Let's storm the court because she missed it the first time. And the security guard, would not, everyone else rushed at the security guard. was like, no, coach, don't do it. Don't do it. They held me. I was like, all right. So pretty cool time to be at Nebraska, man. Volleyball's dominant. You know, what we've done in – you know, you think about what, what we've done here in women's athletics uh, mm -hmm. to, be, to, to do what we did with the Women's Day in volleyball and then to have the – Highest rated women's basketball game it ha happened on Fox the other day. Um, really cool time to be here. Football football just has to catch up to Coach Cook and Coach Williams and Coach Hoiberg and all of them. I, I'm sorry, what what network? I'm not familiar with <laughs> I'm the sorry. network. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, no, sorry. I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> oh, I'm kidding. We, we wouldn't let you go without at least asking about a little bit of local delicacies. Uh, I'm still full from our dinner at Lead Bellies uh, in, uh, in this spring, which was – which every which every meal was based somehow on macaroni and cheese, at least in my at least in my memory somehow. Um, so Sarah, one of our intrepid producers who couldn't join us today, has uh, deep roots in uh, in Lincoln, and she often speaks of a cinnamon roll with chili. That's... At I believe at Runza, can you explain this phenomenon to the uninitiated, Matt? So let me just say this: this is not just Lincoln. It's not like this is all over the state of Nebraska. So I first heard it, I was like, what? And then I went out recruiting, and I had it in recruiting my first winter there. And then this year, even, like, Julie and I had to call uh, Miranda Cole, uh, Malachi's mom, who lives here. And I was like, tell us how to do this. So just think about you have some chili. Let's say you have a little cornbread, right? Like, that's what I did up in the Northeast, right? Chili, a little cornbread. Chili. Just replace the cornbread with a cinnamon roll. So, I mean, it's got, it's got everything you like, right? It's got a couple carbs, got some sugar. <laughs> and you take the, you know, the heat of the chili with the sweetness of the cinnamon roll. It's an absolute game changer. And Runza, I mean, who does it better than Runza? It, I understand there's a 
there's a chain, a fast food chain called Runza, and then there's actual the sandwich itself is also called Runza, right? Yeah, really confusing because sometimes like, the guys will say, "Hey, I'm, I'm gonna go to Runza," and they're like, "Yeah," give me, and then you come back with a burger, and you're like, "I wanted a Runza." No, he went to Runza, but he didn't bring you. So a Runza is just like bread with like meat and cabbage inside. So it's you know got some like German, I guess, probably roots, but it's it's excellent. Um, but yes, it is a restaurant as well. But you can also get the sandwich. You can get a, you can go to some other place. They'll have their own. Run, so a lot, lot to learn. Let, let's, <laughs> I think you're. You go ahead. No, Pete, I go was going to say close with this, but not if you had something to say. I was going to. No, no that, the rules are foodies. You live next door to a food critic when you lived in Philly, right? You lived in the city, and you. The, Mac got mad at me when the draft was in Philly, I think in 17, because I asked a different coach where to go eat. And he was like mad at me for days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's still mad. <laughs> I'm like. Like, that's so, my hometown. Like, you know, you won't go into Vernick. I, I call Chef Vernick for you. I mean, I mean, come on. So where uh, where have you uh, where have you settled on uh, on the best dining in uh, locally there in Lincoln? Okay, all right. Okay, I don't I, here. I can't upset anybody, but the best all around restaurant here in Lincoln, I believe. Okay, I believe is a place called Casa Bovina. You know, Piedmontese Italian heritage beef out in Western Nebraska steakhouse wine list. I sent it to my my guy that I go to Italy with, and he was like. Or are you in Manhattan? I was like, no, bro, I'm in Lincoln because the wine list is that good. So phenomenal, coursed out. Next time you come, if you do, um, I will take care of you there. But the other day, the James, uh, the James Beard Award semifinalists came out, or finalists, top 12, top 12 restaurants in the country. And over in Omaha, which is only 45 minutes away, um, is Yoshitomo Sushi Restaurant in Lincoln, Nebraska. James Beard, top 12. So, of course, we go right there, right? It's my birthday. Julie and I go. Julie's gluten free, celiac. The kids all have it, so she has to order certain things. So Reese, I sit there and I go, Chef. I just raise my hand. I'm like, I'll, and they kind of know who I am, I guess. And I'm like, mm-hmm. just seven courses of what, whatever you want to make. So it's Julie and I at the chefs, like kind of like you know, like the, where you overlook them, you know, making the food. And this gentleman, this gentleman, a guy, and if he, if he sees us, I hope he says, I say what's up to him. He starts talking to Julie. He's from Mississippi, huge Mississippi State fan, knows who I am, doesn't want to bother us. I, the guy starts making me the food. Next thing you know, he's jumping in. And this fan, this table. So next thing we have five people, and we're doing like this tasting, phenomenal. So there's a lot of. I'll just say this: there's a lot of really cool things here in Nebraska that I didn't even know about. Man, I went to the College World Series last year. Unbelievable, you know. And, and not just the Jello shot thing and all. I'm talking about the games, the people, the mm-hmm. restaurants. So hopefully we'll get the game day here soon, and we can do it right for you guys. We'd love that, and uh, given your track record, I expect that to happen in short order. Matt, I really appreciate the time. Always great talking with you, and wish you luck. Look forward to seeing you guys win big this upcoming season. Thanks, y'all. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Matt. You know, I do think Nebraska is going to have success sooner rather than later, and with the expanded playoff, uh, how that success is defined doesn't necessarily mean that you have to beat Ohio State and Michigan every year, or now you have to add, I guess, USC and Oregon and Washington into the mix as well. But Matt Rule, always great to talk to him and look forward to seeing his team get started this fall. You know, I think one of the fascinating things about what Matt was talking about, the differences in college and NFL coaching. And while, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Nick Saban, when when he announced his decision to retire, and then I went to Tuscaloosa to talk with him about that, didn't say that the schedule pushed him out by any stretch of the imagination, just that he wanted to be able to perform the job at a very high level, one that that he had set the standard of performing and felt like maybe it was time to try something else. And the worst kept secret in television and in college football is that that next something that he would do would be sitting on the desk with us at college game day. Uh, Nick has already shown a remarkable ability to slide into that seat and provide expert analysis he handles the tapes well he understands how to how to speak in headlines because he is a a gifted public speaker and not just to his team if you've heard him in any other format it's it's really uh, quite an impressive thing so I, I don't have any doubt at all that he will thrive in this role and I'm looking forward to the new dynamic as you know we have always said on game day Pete for as long as I've been a part of it and, and certainly before that that you have to find ways to improve. You have to find mm-hmm. areas to grow that you cannot stand still. And certainly, I think if you bring Nick Saban into any mix, whether it be your Ferrari dealership, your Mercedes dealership, or your television program, uh, you best not stand still. 
So we're going to be expecting even more news breaking from you in this upcoming season. <laughs> well, yes, I, I do think we're all going to have our spine a little straighter with, uh, with, with Nick Saban around the meeting room and on our, uh, on our, on our Monday zooms. But yeah, I, I mean, it's, uh, what a cool opportunity for us, right. To, to be around a football mind like that and to be able to talk about the, the game. And, uh, I've already heard that, uh, he's a hundred miles an hour into draft prep, probably had a yes, yeah. by the way. So I mean, well, he doesn't have to worry. He doesn't have to worry about basketball because his only experience with basketball is that Nick at noon league where he picked the teams, he called the fouls and he decided who guarded him. <laughs> so, you know, that wasn't, you know, that's not what I'm dealing with at all right now. He's not going to jinx Carolina like you have, Reese. <laughs> I, they can't blame me for that anymore because I was <laughs> under the weather. It was deemed best uh, by the powers that be if perhaps I um, took a seat and made sure that I didn't make anyone ill and um, and Carolina still lost, so it's not that's not on me. Okay, fair. Uh, the jinx is over. Fair enough, but yeah, I think. Well, like selfishly, uh, I'm excited, obviously, and I think it, it adds an adrenaline jolt to <laughs> to a show that's already operating at a at a really high level. But I really think I'm going to learn a lot about football, right? Like that's like mm -hmm. when yeah. when I think about this through the prism of the amount of times that we're sitting in meeting rooms on Fridays on different campuses, and just like the general dialogue. And you sit around and, you know, have conversations. I remember, like, I learned a lot about football from David Pollock because we would mm -hmm. we would trade notes. I talked to coaches. He would watch film and just really, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Nick Saban, obviously see, seen a lot. Um, and so, yeah, it'll be fun. Uh, the, the draft will be the first gateway to that. But just going week in, week out, seeing college football through his eyes is going to be is going to be a treat for us and certainly for our viewers well what do you think about this idea that i have because it, it reminds me of when bob knight joined us mm -hmm. and what do you think if i maybe share a little bit of bob's wisdom with nick as he embarks on this endeavor uh, bob said something to me in our first our first phone conversation after he took the job words that i will never ever forget he said my boy you're in charge out there, and don't you forget it. You'll be leading us, and we'll go where you say we're going. I, I, think, I think Nick would be wise to remember that as he embarks on his television career. Yeah, you can tell him that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to work with him for the same reasons that you are. First of all, uh, the one thing I think that people have seen glimpses of, but I mm -hmm. think they're going to see a lot more of in addition to uh, remarkable X and O insight. They're going to see th this guy's got a really good sense of humor. Mm -hmm. Now it's a dry wit and it's a low key wit and it's a it's a it's a chop busting wit, and I think that is going to play perfectly on that set. And I, I think that there are going to be a lot of uh, fans of maybe uh, whose primary teams aren't in the SEC or certainly aren't Alabama. Mm -hmm. I think Alabama people know this, and a lot of people in the SEC know it. But uh, maybe if they only s really pay attention you know, do all of his press conferences and things like that once the playoff came around. Um, I think they're going to go, wow, didn't know he was that funny. You know, he's, uh, but he's going to be, he's going to be sensational. And that, I think the great thing about him, and, and people have said this a lot about, you know, that he would have been a terrific CEO, that he mm -hmm. could have been a titan of industry, whatever it might be, because of his approach to life. And wanting to be the best and being in the moment and taking care of what you can control right now. He's already had conversations with a number of us about what it looks like. And to your point about draft, about getting a number of guys. And even to the point today, I was having a conversation with one of our producers about this. And he was asking, do I need to pick the plays for all like, you know, 100 guys? And he said, no, you can, you can give me themes. You know, he you know, he moves well in the pocket or, he, you know, he uh, maintains leverage well, whatever it might be. And Nick's response well, it was, well, what if he fumbles a lot? And, you know, it was like, well, you know, and he was speaking broadly, but what if there is a flaw sure. in his game? He said, that's fine, but you don't have to, you know, you don't have to go find, unless it's some type of glaring thing, that's something you can say, you know, mm -hmm. that you don't have to. So it's little things like that, but it shows the level that, uh, that he's thinking already in terms of evaluating players. He's thinking of it already in terms of whether he would be recruiting the player from his days in the NFL, whether you would sign this player, draft this player, whatever it might be. And, and I think it's going to, I think it's going to really um, 
really give uh, an added dimension to our show and certainly a, a different perspective from someone who's accomplished what he has as a coach in, in recent years. Yeah, and I think to, to put a bow on that, Reese, we joked on the pod a couple times this year about his uh, the most unlikely bromance in football with he and Pat McAfee. And uh, I think <laughs> yeah. Pat did an excellent job of yeah. pulling some personality out of Nick, right? Like I really mm-hmm. feel like um, – that weekly Thursday interview was must-see television because Nick was open. He was candid. Uh, there were broad topics he would tackle, uh, you know, at that point in the week. And so I really feel like those, the, the the magnetism of those two um, is going to be a lot of fun to watch. And it might not be fun to manage from your chair as you're oh, it's gonna be No, hey, look, I, I love that stuff because Good. everything else is – you know, if it's too stilted and scripted, I mean, you know, that's why uh, everybody makes fun of me in our meetings because I hate it, hate it when a producer says, you know, well, tee up this guy, tee up that guy. And certainly there are times when you do that, when you're just, you know, setting them up. But in my judgment, good hosts are engaged in the conversation. It doesn't mean they venture out of their lane. It just means they're engaged. So my stock response is always, if you want somebody to just tee this up, go go find a trained seal from the circus or some such thing. They can do that. I've got a life to live. I've got things I could do. And, you know, so the point being is that I think as a host, you want to be engaged in a conversation and the conversation needs to be lively and not just your turn, your turn, your turn. Everybody mm-hmm. takes turns giving soliloquies. You know, that's not very compelling television. And I think that uh, I think that with I think we already have that I'm sure I'm biased in that regard but I think we'll even have a an even more of that and even greater dimension when when Nick comes aboard it's going to be fun yeah and we and we've all we've also been talking about how how to get him to uh to really get on you when you're when you're giving your reports too oh like yeah there's like, there's like funny Pat competition. Did. Well, like Pat, <laughs> like Pat did this year. Pat would always start cheering whenever you came on. <laughs> yeah, Pete. Yeah, <laughs> yeah big te- but big text was looming over my shoulder. That was I was awesome. trying to give a I was trying to give an earnest update about uh <laughs> Tez Walker's return and how many snaps he was gonna go. And there's big text bombing over my shoulder. So and maybe that's what we should start doing. We should start planting things in the crowd to uh, to go over your shoulder right there to see if it distracts you. I want to go back. You, you talked about it right off the top before we visited with Matt Rule. I want to go back to the Chip Kelly thing. Um, Chip, I mean, and you know him. I know him pretty well. I think you know him even a lot better than I do. And, you know, for years they've been talked, well, I'm going to go to New Hampshire and coach high school football or I'm going to coach in the Ivy League or I'm going to coach Navy or whatever because – The Harvard job was open, by yeah, the way. It was. Like, and in this window. Well, you know, <laughs> there's a – Harvard 30 years. And you might have been the one to write it, but I wrote uh, – or I read that there is a Harvard alum who was part of that who was not real happy that he wasn't pursued with greater vigor. Uh, perhaps I did call Harvard like yeah. while it was while his because it, it was pretty clear he was going to leave UCLA and yeah. you know and, and at that point Bill O'Brien the BC job had not opened so um, how about that if there had been dueling Bill O'Brien and Chip Kelly press conferences yeah in Austin how week? about that that would have been something <laughs> wouldn't it it would have uh, made yeah. it was certainly elevated Boston on the college football stratosphere to have both of them there I, I still find it peculiar um, in all honesty and I understand I. I offered that preface because I, I know he prefers to just call plays and the, you know, whether it's the old stories about where the Oregon people couldn't get him to go to the Portland booster club thing often enough and all of that. That's not why he's in it. I understand all of that, but still to walk away, you know, from the UCLA job to take a coordinator's job, even at a great place like Ohio state, still strikes me as one of the more peculiar moves because he, I know there was some pressure. I understand that. And maybe the, maybe the leash wasn't as long as some might have anticipated, but I don't think this fits the quintessential. I'm beating the posse out the door move. This seems more like a choice that he's made based on what he wants to do. And I think it's really unusual. Yes. And I think that, this came about a little bit. He tested, obviously, the NFL OC market. Mm-hmm. There were reports of him popping up, Seattle, Washington, some other places. And to me, Reese, this felt like, okay, if I'm going to leave and I'm going to go call plays, I'm going to do it, by the way, with the best talent, much like he had at Oregon. Right. Yeah. And for someone he's close to, 
Um, so there's not, there's not going to be a lot of uh, a lot of ambiguity on you know he and Ryan Day have a, like a very good relationship. So he's not j- just showing up to work for for a stranger. And so yeah, I really think that uh, now I don't think some of the like Chip Kelly's issues with the greater responsibilities of being a head coach are new. In fact, they're kind of thro- mm-hmm. like he was a little bit of a throwback and mm-hmm. mm-hmm. not not enjoying the sort of full repertoire of responsibilities before it became fashionable and before the responsibilities really got sideways uh, for head coaches with uh, with NIL and such. But I feel like it could be a couple year stop in Columbus where he can call a lot of really good plays. He's certainly got some good tailbacks to work with. Um, with Quinshaw Junkins and uh, Travion Henderson. The offensive line is a question. Like, they, they were not great. Obviously, the last impression of them uh, in the Michigan game and then in the bowl game uh, was was not good. So how he can help Justin Fry get that group up to speed and get the offense going a little bit and getting Will Howard, who is the assumed starter there, going will be, will be interesting. But the chip decision-making was explained to me, Reese, in that uh, in their bowl prep, um, Ryan Gunderson, their quarterback coach, had left for Oregon State at that point, and Chip coached the quarterbacks. And I was just told he was the hap- it was the happiest he'd been in years. He hadn't coached a position in years, and he just kind of said, "This is what I like to do." Um, and uh, obviously, Chip's made a lot of money, and so he's just like he's going to go do it. So nobody's crying for Chip only making two million, and he he certainly wouldn't uh, would wouldn't say that. And and he's in a position to win, which is probably going to put him in position to you know if in a couple of years have another. Uh, springboard to another job but it's uh you know it's it's what matt said earlier right he said he doesn't coach much football and do much x's and mm-hmm. o's so chip is mm-hmm. uh is is going back to that and uh yeah i think it's i think it's pretty ohio state was probably the most compelling team in the country entering 2024 I, I, would you agree with that yeah yeah i think so yeah. I, I i still think georgia's probably going to be preseason number one sure but yeah. but ohio state will be two and they will probably be the most fascinating team simply because they have pushed all of their chips mm-hmm. no pun intended yeah. uh to the middle right now by getting all of these players by uh by definition from some of their own alums about how well I don't think Ohio State will ever do it the way well yes they are you know (laughs) they went out and and opened the vault and done it exactly uh the way the most aggressive port of people are doing it and they it's as if they're like okay Michigan's won it and so now you know not all bets are off all bets are on we're, we're doing everything now. We're getting Chip Kelly. We're getting Will Howard. Uh, we're getting Julian Say, and we're getting Caleb Downs. We're getting Quinchon Judkins. You know, we're getting, uh, we're going to get, we're going to load it up and you better win. And, mm-hmm. you know, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of way it feels. So I do think they're the most, uh, the most fascinating team going into the season for sure. Yeah. Did you see that they fired Chris Holtman today? I'm not surprised. I did not see it. You're breaking yeah. news to me, as you often do. Uh, he's the basketball coach there, yes. and a really and a really good coach. Mm-hmm. Um, Excellent coach. Great it, track record. Yeah, the results. He's not had two good seasons. It, it's been r- really weird because yes. each of the last two years they've started extraordinarily well, mm-hmm. and then they and then they hit January and they go into these deep funks and they can't win, and mm-hmm. so that's you know. That was that's a little. It's not surprising from that standpoint. It's you know, but it's surprising that a coach that I believe is a really good one as he mm-hmm. is, sort of fell into this rut. And in some ways, it was a lot like what we were talking about. Rule a little bit different from Matt because it's more institutional and not just about him. But it's as if Ohio State once a Big Ten conference play started and they lost a couple, they couldn't get out of their own way. They couldn't figure out how to mm-hmm. win a game. Much like Nebraska can't figure out how to finish games, and that predates rule. And it's something, uh, you know, it was interesting because he's right. He wasn't there. Mm-hmm. But it is something that sort of permeates a program. I think mm-hmm. I, there is a such thing sometimes as that type of a institutional voodoo, I think. Let's go back to UCLA quickly. Foster, do they view that as the right long-term fit, or are they hoping it's the right long-term fit? Well, I think at that stage in the cycle, and if you looked at the last few coaching searches there, there wasn't a hot group of five guys. There wasn't a logical guy. There wasn't an alum in the NFL. Mm -hmm. There wasn't sort of like, you know, there wasn't a Bill O'Brien who's from there and wanted to come home. Um, It just wasn't a place where they were going to be able to go grab a high-profile guy. 
They mm-hmm. uh, they kicked the tires on PJ Fleck. They did a couple other things, and I I really think Reese they they or you know you hire opposites, right? Um, Chip was not an elite recruiter at UCLA. He did a great job in the portal, but that wasn't where and how he spent his his energy. So Deshaun Foster with the four backs that it, that got drafted mm-hmm. four years in a row. He recruited and developed all those guys. Like he's well known in LA. He's well known in Orange County. He's well known at UCLA. He's one of the great mm-hmm. players in school history. So um the there's a little bit of the 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 Dabo model. Okay, go be a leader. Uh mm-hmm. he comes from a family military background, discipline, go be the face of the program, have a Bruin in charge. And that, look, there's a lot of untapped potential for UCLA in terms of NIL, in terms of their alumni, in terms of their fan base. Go, go cr- forge an image for us in this new era. So it is uh, a bit of an unconventional hire because there aren't a, there are a handful of guys who, who've never called plays who, uh, who end up getting head coaching jobs. Uh, Fleck is one of them. Urban Meyer is one of them. Uh, Dabo is one of them. Um, but you don't see it that often. And uh, the, the vision was cast to me, uh, you know, as, as I stated, okay, we're, we're going to go to the Big Ten. We're going to be different than USC, right? They're all offense under Lincoln, mm-hmm. throw it around. You, you can see UCLA sort of being energized a little bit around being smash mouth and, and, mm-hmm. and running the ball and, and forging that identity pushing forward. I don't think Alabama has to worry about just having the figurehead. There was some consternation after losing um, – Ryan Grubb and losing the mm-hmm. offensive line coach, Scott Huff. But I'm of this belief. And look, Ryan Grubb has built a great reputation or else he wouldn't be an offensive coordinator in the National Football League now um, as we speak. But if you have greater concerns over your coordinators than you do the head coach, you've got the wrong head coach. The head coach, the head coach is the most important. Doesn't mean you can just have anybody. you got to have good coordinators. I understand that. But – the head coach is more important. And, you know, it'll be interesting to see because this is a, this would probably alarm Alabama people. There's a real heavy flavor of Indiana 2019 uh, throughout, the, throughout the program now with, uh, with DeBoer being there and Nick Sherrod and even uh, David Ballou, who's been there several years now as their uh, director of performance. But he came from Indiana along with Matt Ray before Matt went on to the Saints in the NFL. So, uh, but I... I'm not. I'm not too alarmed about that. There's going to be a transition there, no matter who okay. was on the sidelines, and they might be better off because you got the feeling with Grubb, as good as he is, that he wanted to be the head coach at Washington, and he also had NFL aspirations, and that maybe, you know, maybe when you're starting, and especially when you're following Saban, maybe you need everybody sort of, you know, viewing this as a really, really good step instead of a, a sidestep or a detour or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, and good thing, Reese, your alma mater, Alabama, their fans are very patient, right? I mean, they've <laughs> really been noted just for pragmatism. They're going to accept every loss that comes this season calmly. They'll be completely rational about it. Um, there is going to be an adjustment to the Kalen yes. DeBoer era. Yes, so just, no doubt. Just be, be, be ready for it. That, that is not a college football playoff roster that's on campus right now. We'll see what the roster look like, looks like after spring. Um, recruiting has gone well, but there is going to be a little bit of a regrowth that has to happen there. So I will preach patience, but I know they've already embraced patience there. I'm yeah, very, they're very comfortable with that. They're, uh, you know what? It, it's I, I want I'm going to be interested to see where they're viewed. They've got a pretty tough schedule as well. Sure. Um, I I do th- I think is a potential playoff roster, but it's a young one. Uh, you know, even last year under Saban, okay. I remember saying that I thought that uh, they were a year away. Now they lose downs; that's a big deal, you know, mm-hmm. for sure. But they've got a, they've got a lot of pieces back, and they've got a lot of people who've been waiting to waiting to break through. And you know, it'll be, but there, but there will be growing pains, man. I mean, there yes. almost always are growing pains when you change and when you make this type of change going to be going to be too. Uh, Adrian wanted us to talk about something that um, she she just threw it out there that we should talk about that I think is right up our alley. Have you seen this new Apple vision pro thing for the low, low price of $3,500? Have so you seen my, this my thing? knowledge of it is based as an Apple stockholder. I want it to work because I want Apple stock to keep going up. Well, and and okay. I've seen like a couple clips of like a dude on the sideline at NBA games and everyone wanting to punch him in the face because he's wearing it like courtside. 
it's it, it's I, I just it's the bane of our existence, Pete. I mean, people are already uh, antisocial because their faces are just staring down at their phones. Uh, what? You know, they're they're oh, sorry. exactly. <laughs> they're you know they're unaware of the surroundings. And while I'm sure there are some great qualities for this device, I'm sure watching a movie or something is spectacular because you're you're surrounded, you're in the moment, and the headphones, the whole thing. But we we don't need people like out in public and sitting around, you know doing all this if you're watching on youtube you know, see the commercials the guys grabbing on this so you know i don't wish you apple stockholders maybe i am too you know um i don't wish you any ill for this but i am worried about our society i want us to engage with each other a little bit more we're already having a hard enough time you know with with the phones and, and now we're going to put you know I'm not going to say that. Boy, sometimes my discipline is so impressive. Um, <laughs> I almost said something that would have really gone viral that I don't Don't need say to. it. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to. But we, you know, we don't need people, you know, now they don't even, they can't hear or see anything going on around them. So, but I'm sure it's a remarkable device if you're maybe, you know, Stuck in the house by yourself or not, and you really want to immerse yourself in, in a movie. I'm sure it's spectacular, or or a game, or something like that. You know, because I like the I like the other ones that you play games with and stuff. You know, it's, those are fun. Yeah, I'd be but. curious how that accentuates the sports viewing experience. I know very little about it, by the way. So yeah. I don't. But like, I wonder if we're going to be at the point someday where you can like be in the backfield, maybe you know, and and watch your favorite quarterback. You can watch Jalen Milrow from the, you know, like you, like from what it looks like live in the game when he drops back in the pocket. Like, would, it, would I know? Would I know exactly what Drake May was seeing? Yes, you would okay. love that. that. That would be spectacular. You would, that, you would, be, you would highly, uh, you would that, highly enjoy that. That that would be that'd be really good. But I, you know, I hope it works. I hope it's better than watching sports on the 3D television, which was completely overrated. Did yes. you ever see that? That was like, yeah, so that blocked. bombed. That yeah, bombed. it was no good. It yeah. was like, I, I guess the statute of limitations. I can say this now. This is not what I almost said. It sort of went went the way of ESPN the phone. Remember ESPN the phone? I think you're safe to make an ESPN the phone joke. <laughs> I think it's that's not really okay. a joke. I'd say it's more an observation. Didn't yeah. go well. <laughs> Didn't go well. Well, yeah. wait, once you reach discussing ESPN the phone, you know you have reached the end of the podcast. So, uh, thanks for joining us. We encourage you to download wherever you prefer to get your podcast. Happy Valentine's Day to all of you! For if you're like Matt Rule and you've forgotten, and if they get this podcast dropped in time, you better hurry, or else you're going to be in a world of trouble. Download the podcast wherever you like to. Better yet, subscribe. Pete and I will talk to you next time.